called Purpose Driven Life. And the, the series is basically outlining what we were crafted for, what we were made for. And so if you're brand new to our church, this is a great series to jump in on because you're kind of getting a sense of kind of the discipleship perspective of, of our church. If you've been here, if you've been a Christian for decades, this is awesome for you because this is a reset on what we were crafted for, which is super easy for us to drift away from. So the first week, what we did was we went through and talked about the fact that we were crafted and planned for God's pleasure, that we're not created for us, that life is, uh, it goes sideways fast when we are me-centric, when we're self-absorbed people. Um, I know. And so it's something that we needed to go the opposite direction, and we need to go for God's pleasure, that life is all about his worship. Now, secondly, the second purpose is formed for God's family, which is why, like, you being here is awesome. Because, again, you are crafted to be within God's family. Not, you know, there are no silos. There's no, like, remote Christianity. Christianity was intended to be done within community. You are better as a person that is following Jesus as someone who's within community. Because when you're within community, you have to learn how to forgive people. And it's hard to forgive people when you're all by yourself. Even though forgiving yourself is a big deal too. But form for God's family, that is a massively important thing that we have when you are actually gathering together. The third purpose is created to become like Christ. And that's what we're going to be talking about this weekend. Um, back when I first came to NBC, uh, this was our youth group. This, I, I came as a youth pastor. This was all of 360. This was right before we went on a retreat. Um, actually, it's kind of cool because today, uh, this weekend, there's like 70 high schoolers on the same retreat, uh, but now they're out there. But this was w- the way that we all started. And this was, again, a long, long time ago. Um, a lot of these high schoolers are now in, in nursing homes. But they, it was one of those things where back then, we started out, and when we started off with this ministry, when we, we started off um, doing this, when Julie and I were, were in this ministry, one of the things that I learned in student ministry was at, at Moody Bible Institute is that you should have something that your youth group has as far as its identity. Like, what's its name and everything else? And so the name that we came up with was 360. And I remember saying, yeah, our name is 360. And someone's like, oh, so that's like when God gets a hold of your life, he turns you around. Now, I'm not good at math. I'm really not good at math. But I knew that that wasn't accurate. That's a 180. I, know I, was, a, I was a skateboarder, so I knew what a 180 was. Your skateboard's like this. Like, it, now it's 180. Um, 360 is if you do a full circle. And so they're like, oh. So, like, God gets a hold of your life and nothing changes. You go right back to the beginning. Like, no, it's not at all. What it is is this. If you take any point on, on a plane and you have that point, it's surrounded by 360 degrees all around it. And the idea was this. This was the goal of 360. I grew up in church land, and I loved church, but I, was, I totally got why people didn't like Christians, because church people can be hypocritical. Non-church people are too, but just unreligiously so. We get to be religiously hypocritical. And so the thing that I, I remember growing up thinking was like, man, it's so, such a bummer to be a high schooler and look at older adults, and they're like, oh yeah, I believe in God. I check the box when I show up to church. I have the right theology. I believe the right right thing. And that's like basically they go through life checking those boxes. But the person they are with their family, radically different. The person they are at work with their friends, how they conduct themselves and everything, radically different. And so there's this hypocrisy that the world saw and picked up on. And us as high schoolers picked up and and were like, we don't want any part of that. So when I came out of um, college and and we had a chance to start our own student ministry, I'm like, I want it to be 360. Because I want it to be like every student, whether they're at church or whether they're at school, or whether they're they're with their friends, or whatever. I want every high school student to recognize that they have 360 degrees around them, that any direction they go, they can be a consistent person, not a hypocritical person. Not like, oh yeah, I'm this way at youth group, or I'm this way at church, or I'm this way with my family. But when with my friends, it's totally different. But that anywhere they go, from that point, any direction of those 360 degrees, they could be living all for Christ all the time. That was the goal of 360. And this is still the goal of 360. And, and it's, it's a, it sounds like a good goal for a youth group, but it's not a goal for a youth group. This is Christianity. We were formed to become like Christ. We were formed to develop character that emulated him, that we become more and more like him. And we see this in the passage we're studying today, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. So if you could turn in your Bibles to that passage. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to this church in Corinth. 
And he's digging deep into the Hebrew culture here. Like he's going historical. And like the Michael Jordan of the, of the Jewish faith was Moses. And the, the big thing that Moses is known for, two big things, is one thing is he gets the, the, the slaves out of Egypt. That's a big deal. But really the big, big deal is Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, Moses goes to Mount Sinai, goes up Mount Sinai to meet with God and receives from God not 10 commandments, but over 600 commandments that are summarized by 10 commandments. And this was a big deal to them because they're they're not like, oh man, look at all these rules, 600 plus rules, who needs that? Their perspective was, we've been under the boot of the Pharaoh, man. This guy, everyone thinks this guy's God, we know he's not. And we're just basically, we have no idea what we're supposed to do. We have no idea the expectation except for slave labor. And now we know there's one true God who loves us so much that he gives us specific directives on how we connect with him, how we conduct ourselves with one another. And so the law for them was a big deal. But when Moses comes down, like the thing that tripped them out was Moses' face. Now, I don't know if he was not easy on the eyes generally, but when he came down from Mount Sinai, his image, because he was around the glory of God in such proximity, was like glowing. That's the descriptor, description. To the point that he had to put, up, people were like, okay, cover that up. Cover that up. Because it was like he had to put a veil over his face because it looked so weird to them. This is like, I don't know what that, I don't know what that's, how to describe that outside of like, The veil was something that people, it was too much God. It was too close to God. And so that's the context behind what Paul is saying as he's digging deep into this historical moment, but talking about it through the lens of a Christian. So if you could stand as we read God's word, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 and following. Paul says this, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. Okay, covenant, that's another word for testament. Another word for promise. And so old covenant being read is like whenever the Old Testament is read, it's still like there's this blockade where they're not really seeing the face of, of what God's doing. It's kind of like they're, they're dull to it. Verse, uh, let's go back to 14. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains When the old covenant is read, it has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Who is the Spirit? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, have a seat. Okay, so let's take a look and just do a little deeper dive on that last verse. And we all, with, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being what? Transformed. That word for transformed in Greek is metamorpho. Everyone say metamorpho. Isn't that fun to say? Metamorpho. Now, here's the thing. Metamorpho, what, what word do we hear in metamorpho? Metamorphosis, well, we also hear foo. Yeah, that's true. Foo. But metaphorse, metamorphosis, which is that trans, like that whole like butterfly thing of like it was this, but all of a sudden it's radically different, more beautiful, more developed. And he's saying that is what's happening to us. That's the goal. The idea of, of, of following Jesus is not so that you're just a good person or not just you're going to be in heaven one day. The goal of Christianity is that you're transformed. You're metamorpho. You're like, you're, something is happening. Into what? His image. Okay, this is what totally tripped me up this week. When Pastor Eric and I were, we were studying this passage, I was like, hold on a second. Genesis 1 says that we were created in God's image. As humans, we're created in God's image. So what's the deal here? We're being transformed into what we already are? That makes zero sense to me. Like, why in the world am I being transformed into something that I was already, in Genesis 1, created as? And then all of a sudden, we understand the rest of the scriptures. Because Genesis 1, we are created in God's image. But our rebellion from God, our sin broke that. And all of a sudden it talked about us, our, the creation itself was marred. Everything in creation all of a sudden had an expiration date. Everything that is good breaks down. Everything that's awesome gets old. Relationships, bodies, the environment, everything breaks down. And so what we see in Jesus is a reversal of that. We were created in God's image. Sin has marred us to the point where the creation itself is tweaked. It's broken. It's, it's, it's out of place. But through Jesus, we are being transformed back into the image that we were crafted in in the first place. We're we're, we're new creations. We're new creations. We're we're no longer the old creation. The new has come. 
We're going right back to Eden. Here's the cool thing. The more I become like Jesus, the more truly human I am. I said this a couple of weeks ago, but like a lot of us, we want to be authentic to ourselves. I want to be true to me. Well, the truest arrow, the truest arrow is the arrow who sounds like Jesus, who acts like Jesus, who treats people like Jesus. That's the truest me. Not, not the me that's just like, whatever I want to do, I do. That's the imposter. That's the poser. That's the saboteur. That's not the real me. The truest arrow is the arrow who looks like, sounds like, acts like Jesus. The character of, of me starts to get shaped more and more like him. And that seems to be the goal. With ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's the what. But what's the how? Like, how do we do that? How do we get metamorphosed? How do we get transformed into having the character of God? Well, this, actually, this, this passage teases it right here. Through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, like, it, like, we think sometimes, like, man, there's no way I could, like, follow God because it's, I've got so much stuff that's just jacked up in my life. I've got, I'm, I'm backwards and messed up, and I can't handle the heavy lifting of all that. But the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit is the one who, once you become a Christian, His task is to work alongside you so that He's developing in you the character of Christ, so that you start to sound like, act like, engage others like Christ. You think like Christ. That's His job. And so that we actually have that. Another passage, even put it this way, Romans 12, 2. We've uh, studied this a couple weeks back, but it says this. Be what? Same word. Same metamorpho. That's the same word. Be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. This work in Greek is talking about a renovation, a change for the better. Okay, now, does anyone drive a Ford Fiesta? Okay, if you do, no shame. This is okay, right? This is a safe place. But if, let's just say you did drive a Ford Fiesta and someone said, I would like to trade for your Ford Fiesta this Ferrari, what would you say? Yes! You don't even have to think about it. You're like, well, I don't know. I've got some nostalgia with my Ford Fiesta. No! This is a Ferrari! You're like, you would give him the keys before he had a chance to change his mind. Why? Because that is a change for the better. You are leveling up big time. And that's what this word in Greek means. It's this great change, a shift for the better. It's not like, well, what a sacrifice. No, this is a big, this is like you are getting the better side of the deal. When we renew our mind, when we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit's renewal, and transformation, all of a sudden, we st- we're trading Fiesta for Ferrari, folks. And that's like a big deal. And, and the Holy Spirit's work in that is transforming us bit by bit. And what we're going to talk about is four ways that the Holy Spirit does that. We're going to zoom out from this passage and see what he says in other passages. And the first way that the Holy Spirit does that is to transform us by truth. Transform us by truth. Now, if you, you know, been in church land or you've been a Christian long enough, you know that the Bible is, that's, it's, it's truth. This is from God. God has given us his word. Now, the Bible is all true, but not all truth is in the Bible. Like, for example, if you have, like, alternator problems or you have issues with your brakes, it's not in Lamentations where you're going to find out how to fix that. Okay? If your kid is struggling knowing how to tie their shoes, you're not going, oh, well, First Peter says. And it's, not, it's not in there. Okay? That doesn't happen. Those are truths, but they're outside of the Bible. Okay? Does that make sense? But there's no truth that will contradict the Bible because this is the supreme court of truth. Like all truth in the land submit to that. So for example, if someone was like, well, you know what? The best thing a person can do is to hate their enemy. I think that's the tr- most truthful thing to do. We would say, actually, no. Scripture says to love your enemy. And this is the ultimate truth. Jesus put it this way. Therefore, anyone, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into what? Practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Jesus' brother James, in the book of James, says we need to be not just hearers of the word, but what? Doers! And you know what that's called? Not a hypocrite. Hypocrites are hearers, and like, yeah, mm-hmm. and then they go around and do the opposite thing, right? Jesus and the rest of Scripture is like, you want to know what actually transforms you? Is listening to God's truth and operating accordingly. But that's a decision. Um, on one of the, the days in the, devo- man, your devotions this week are like worth the price of admission for that book. You're going to love this week. It's awesome. One of the things that Warren says on day 24 is this. The most important decision you can make today is to settle this issue of what will be the ultimate authority for your life. Decide regardless of culture, tradition, reason, or emotion, you choose your Bible as your final authority. Again, we've got lots of truths out there, lots of desires out there, but we choose it as our final authority. Warren, he said later on this, I thought this was awesome, that in order to do this, we change our autopilot. 
In other words, the, there's a way that's natural. You're just like basically you're coasting through life. You don't even have to think about it. And there's two ways that people do that when we're making our decisions as far as what, what is truth. The first one is this. What do I feel like? What do I believe? And, and, and whatever I believe, I, 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 that's what I'm going to do. You know, what do I feel about this? Is this going to make me happy? Is this going to feel good, etc.? That's my truth. And then the other side is, what does everyone else believe? What do they do? Like, what do they, what do they believe about this? And so people go through life basically like shooting from the hips and, and shooting from the gut going, I'm going to make decisions on what truth is truthful to me based on what I like, or I'm going to listen to everyone else and see what they like and do what they say. So you either become a people pleaser or a self pleaser. And all of us know, every single one of us, and if you're older than 12 years old, you know what it's like to do what you want to do and have that blow up in your face. That's a bad call. We all know, if you're older than 12, what, doing what everyone else wants to do is a bad call. We end up actually like seeing that blow up in our face too because we're not created for either one of these. Instead, we were created to say, okay, there's going to be tons of times that I'm going to want to do something that the ultimate truth of my life is going to contradict and I have to make a decision. What's my ultimate authority? There's going to be tons of times that culture is going to be saying, this is what is true. That's going to contradict with God's authority. And I have to make a decision. Well, whose authority am I rolling with on this? If you want to be transformed by Christ, you basically just set in, in your mind, I'm going with his ultimate authority. That there's going to be lots of moments where I have to ask God, what do you believe about this? What do you want me to do about this? And then roll, that, roll, roll accordingly. And I can guarantee you this. Um, if you do that, you will have a decision to make because what you want to do is going to contradict with what this wants you to do. It does me. There's tons of stuff I don't like in the Bible. I wish it wasn't there. It'd be way easier in my mind if it wasn't. There's a ton of stuff in our culture. Our culture would love the Bible if this part was edited out or that part was edited out. But we do that if we're the ultimate authority, if we are the arbiters of truth. If we're not, however, if it's God, he's given us his word, well, then all of a sudden we go, okay, even though I can't put it all together and why, I have to settle that as my final authority. You want to be transformed? That's your truth. And that, that's the why you should do it. But let me just tell you, why you how you get to do it, okay? Because again, I told you that, that recently, my, I am, I'm someone who I love God's word. I love reading God's word. But I'm so flaky with how to read God's word. Like sometimes I'll read it in the middle of the day or maybe, you know, this. And I, I don't do the same. I've got like ADHD of spirituality where I'm like doing one thing for three months. Then I get bored and have to change course. You might be like me on, on that. But what I've recently just absolutely loved is as the kids are out of the house, boom, they're gone, they're gone. I go to the backyard and I sit around in our like secondhand um, curbside garbage furniture and I just love it. It's awesome. I sit there and just look how happy my legs look. I'm sitting there and I get a chance to read God's word. I get to read some of the, I'm going through the Purpose Driven Life as a devotional now and then I read some of the Bible. If you, if you don't have something where you're reading, you've got a place like this inside, outside, at a coffee shop where you could just read God's word. If you don't know where to start, I'd say start reading in the Gospel of Luke. And just read through it. When you get done, start it again. You're going to be reading all about Jesus' life. It's amazing, okay? But I get out there, and I just love it. My neighbors are out here, like, looking at me, going, like, what a weirdo. And they're right. But the cool thing is that I'm just absolutely enjoying it. When I, when I read God's Word, I like to underline, because, again, I get distracted easily. And so unless I'm, like, doing something with both my eyes and my, and my hand, I like to underline stuff or make notes, I, get, I go off script, and I start daydreaming. And so this helps me. And, and it's like something where, again, I get a chance to soak into that. I love that. And, you, and listen, you're created for that. If Some of you work out all the time. You work out all the time. You're sick, sick people. You, you like working out. But isn't it true that sometimes you work out even when you don't want to? Why? Because you know that there's an ultimate effect down the road that you're, like, that you're working towards. Some, some of you, you have a hobby or a craft, and you spend time in it over and over again. And it's not always because every single time it's just fully enriching. It's because you know that the product of a, a, a scope of time with that thing actually shapes you into being more geared towards that craft. Some of you eat. No, all of you eat. Why do you eat? Well, outside of the fact that it's delicious, it's delicious. And if you didn't eat, you would die, right? Warren puts it this way. God's word is the spiritual nourishment you must have to fulfill your purpose. The Bible is called our milk, 
bread, solid food, and sweet dessert. This four-course meal is the spiritual menu for spiritual strength and growth. If you want to be transformed, if you want the Holy Spirit to transform you, this is part of how you do that. This is one of the key avenues. You're transformed by truth in God's Word. Start reading in the Bible. Start reading in the book of Luke, and, and you'll see God doing and shaping you in crazy, awesome ways. The second way that God transforms us is He transforms us through trouble. Now, there's no one in here that like, man, you know what I'd love to plot into this week? You know what I'd love to calendar? A little bit of trouble. We hate trouble, okay? And a lot of people, they feel blindsided when they become a Christian. Like, what's the deal? I got on Team Jesus, and my life still has trouble. In fact, sometimes I feel like I got on Team Jesus, and there was more trouble, which shouldn't be too big of a shock, because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. In fact, the people that were tightest with Jesus died with a ton of trouble. Again, Jesus did not die on the cross to make you comfortable. He didn't die on the cross to make you healthy. He didn't die on the cross that you have an awesome retirement or like a sick house with great toys. He didn't, he didn't die for any of those things. Jesus died on the cross to make a way for you to come back in relationship with God and to give you the capacity so you could start to follow him. Trouble is something that is part of a life part of a world that, again, has been marred by sin. Everything breaks down. Everything expires. Everything goes south quick. But here's the thing. Scripture says that this does not have to be a dead end for us. It's not a cul-de-sac. It's not a period at the end of the sentence. It can actually be the avenue that God gets us to become more and more like Jesus. But how do we get through the trouble? Recently, recently as in last Friday, yesterday, the day before yesterday, um, I finished a bike... uh, trip with Andy. Andy had this idea like, hey, wouldn't it be great to cycle to Starve Rock or maybe get dropped off at Starve Rock and, and ride back? I'm like, that sounds great. I've always wanted to do that. He's like, oh, cool. Actually, I was looking at the map. Wouldn't it be cool if we went to Iowa and rode back from Iowa? I'm like, how, how far is that? He's like, that's 135 miles. I'm like, who does that? I'll tell you who does that. Stupid people do that. And so I was all in. And so we were like, we're like, we're like going on this thing and like about uh, somewhere between 40 and 60 miles in, your body starts to say something to you. Why? <laughs> Why? Why did you do this? Why, what were you thinking? Everything hurts. I'm not even going to tell you all the parts that hurt, but they all do. And it was awful. It was like one of those things where like, and so you had to get into this, like when you think about riding a bike, oh, I'm riding a bike. But all of a sudden, when you're like that far in, you're just like, I have to think about this. And so Andy and I had two different strategies. My strategy was, was uh, Dory from Finding Nemo. That was my, that's what got me through this. It was thinking about Dory saying, keep swimming, keep swimming, keep swimming. And so for me, I was like, okay, just focus on keep pedaling. Every pedal, every pedal is one pedal closer to Manuka. Just keep pedaling. Just keep pedaling. Andy was like, I got to keep like, an, like a light at the end of the tunnel. I got to think about the goal. I got to breathe and just like know that I'm, get, every, I'm getting close to the goal. So keep focusing on the goal. And, and the cool thing is, is that the, the goal was we have to finish this. We're going to accomplish this. We have to get through this. And the, the neat thing is that as a Christian, we have this journey that is full of trouble. It's painful. It's difficult. But scripture gives us a similar type of way we get through. In fact, Paul talks about it in Romans 8. He says that it, one, after talking about all this difficult, bad, terrible stuff that happens to Christ followers, he says this, and we know that in what? All things, not like the good things, the positives in life, the things that you can go, yeah, no. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Okay, let me just say this. If you don't have a relationship with God, this is not a promise you can own. If you don't love God, and you're here because you're investigating, you're, you're asking questions, I'm so glad that you're here. This is an amazing place to investigate. But one of the things we see in Scripture as a promise is that anyone who does love God, they will have trouble in their life. They will have difficulty, pain, setbacks. And your promise is that we know that in all, all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And that, that, mean, that doesn't mean that God's like, oh, okay, Steve loves me. I'm going to throw like a bunch of bad stuff in his life. <laughs> Why? I love Steve so much. Bad stuff. God's not like causing all these bad things. What we have is a world that, again, our enemy wants to destroy us, and so bad happens. In a world that's in rebellion from God, bad happens. But God says, I will not let any of these bad things be the end of the story. Not on my watch. I am going to convert, if you are in a relationship with me, I'm going to convert even the worst bad in your life into something that is going to be for your good. 
weird. It's like he, he's, he's not letting it waste. It's not letting, it's not just like, in, in the world, lots of bad stuff happens. But if you're a Christian, you have a promise that it's, it'll never be the end of the story. It's going to be something that God's actually going to use for your benefit. But again, what did we talk about? What, what's the ultimate benefit of what God's trying to do inside of us? It says, that, it says on the next verse, for those God foreknew, he also predestined, which is another word for like weld, like hardwired. He hardwired to your storyline this, to be conformed to what? The image of his son. Your purpose, you in being created, you're created to be like Christ, to act like Christ, to think like Christ, to speak like Christ, to operate like Christ. And it's actually troubles that are a part of the way that we do that. That's part of how God brings us closer to his character. The worst troubles that you've gone through are not good. They're evil. They're bad. They're wicked. Things that have been done to you or results of things that you've done, they're horrible. Some of you ha- are walking with maladies and difficulties that you were born with or happened midlife. None of those things are awesome. They're all bad. They're evil. They're, they're wicked. They're horrible. They're trouble. But your promise from God is that none of those things will be wasted. They were intended to destroy you, but God could take even those bad things and convert them into something that's for your good. Warren put it this way. Everything that God permits in your life happens for that purpose, to make you more, to make you more like Christ. Hebrews puts it this way, that we endure as Christians, we endure hardship as discipline, that it actually could be the trainer. The people that I know that are the most mature Christians who love Jesus, and I'm not talking about people who became a Christian like six minutes ago. They're like, woohoo, I love Jesus. We're like, cool, it's been six minutes. But like people that have been like Christians for like 60 years. The people that are the most mature, tightest Christians are not the people who have had the easiest lives. The people that I know that are the most joy-filled, mature Christians are not the people who life has gone their way the most, and, and, and everyone else around them, it's been awful. No, for the people that I know that are the most mature Christians who are the most joy-filled are the people that have, are carrying the scars on their soul from the events of their life, and yet they chose to let God use those troubles to draw them closer to him. And they look back on them and they didn't like anything that they went through, but they see God's fingerprints in carrying them through them. And they allowed those things to train them, those hardships to train them to make them more and more like Jesus. God does that. He transforms us through truth. He transforms us through trouble. And he transforms us through temptation. Now again, temptation is bad, right? We don't like it. It's something that Satan does to trip us up. He wants to, he wants to, to take us off the rails of what God's crafted us for. But here's the thing. Scripture says that when we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit's working on us to develop the character of Christ and then spells out what that looks like by the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 puts it this way, but the fruit or the like effect or the benefit of the Holy Spirit working inside of you is love, joy, peace. A lot of translations say patience and, or for, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the effect. If you're a Christian, those things are like working percentages up inside of you. You're, you're actually growing in those. Now, that's a really great list. Um, which one do you struggle with the most? Like which one you're like, okay, I'm a Christian, but man, I, I bet you the people in your row could tell you. Like Julie could go down there. It'd be like a bingo card for me uh, in different ways, right? But check this out. This is what God does inside of us. And, and the interesting thing is that temptation actually comes into our life by our enemy to destroy us, and God doesn't allow that. He commandeers that. I, I love how Warren put it. He put it this way. God develops the fruit of the Spirit in your life by, he grows those in your life. He develops those in your life by allowing you to experience circumstances, circumstances in which you're tempted to express the exact opposite quality. So in other words, one of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And if you need to develop that in your life, you know what you're going to see a lot of in your life? Stupid people that try your patience that you want to put through the wall. People you work with, you're like, and you're tempted to act out, speak out, act out, whatever. I'm going to put this person through the wall. And all of a sudden you go, hey, Lord, I am tempted to do something that goes against the very quality of patience that you called me to, to flesh out, to be having the character of Christ. Help me say no to this temptation. And when you don't put that coworker through the wall, you walk away and that part of your soul has developed. It's become more resilient, stronger, 
You've just grown and started to flex a muscle that's growing inside of you. Self-control is the same way. Most of us struggle, struggle with some degree of self-control. And it's super easy to say, look at all the times that I've said yes to the thing I'm tempted against, I'm tempted with. If you're a Christian, it's not that you're not tempted. It's what you have now is you've got the capacity to say no. Um, Paul says in another passage, no temptation has attacked you except for what's common to everybody. But God is faithful and he will give you a way out. That means that when you have a temptation, you've got the ability to say, I'm going to say no to this. And when you do, you walk away, like initially, like just white knuckling, whatever the thing that you were, you were saying no to. But as you walk away, you start to recognize the fact that there's something about saying no to that thing that I wanted so bad that makes me feel so alive. And you know why that is? It's because that's what you were created for, to be like Christ. Self-control, love, goodness, patience, Self-control, all, all these things, these are at capacity. The God is giving you the opportunity to grow in each one of those areas. God will transform you through truth. He'll transform you through trouble. He'll transform you through temptation. And lastly, he'll transform you through time. One of the biggest struggles that we have is why does it take so stinking long? Like if I'm really supposed to be a Christian, why is it like this is such a struggle for me? But the Bible never talks about this automatic, like, script flip happening in our, in our soul. What ends up, it, the Bible describes as seeds being planted and fruit growing and us developing kind of agriculturally. Some of you have already picked apples, right? You've gone to the apple orchard. How many have gone to the apple orchards already? Okay, two people in here are festive. Good for you. <laughs> the rest of us got to get our game on. All right. Nobody watches an apple grow. We enjoy apples. We know apple trees are there. We see it, maybe the buds start, and then we see a little bit of a fruit, and then all of a sudden we see the end. But no one watches. There's no time lapse that a person just stands in front of a tree. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to get it this time. No one does that. It takes too long. So do you. If you're frustrated how long it takes you to grow in patience, to grow in self-control, in self-control, to grow in goodness and gentleness. And these are things that, man, I just feel like I've struggled for so long. What's the point? Realize that it takes time, a frustrating amount of time. God is less concerned with how much time it takes and more concerned with the character he's developing in you to be like, think like, talk like, act like Christ. That's what you were created for. That's who you are. That's the truest you. You know, I never really wanted to be a, a lead pastor. I wanted to be a youth pastor forever. I wanted to be like a 75-year-old bald old dude with a cane going to Great America with the students. That's, that was like, I, I wanted to tell like high school students about Jesus till I was dead. That was the goal. And so when, like when I was in 360, I'm like, if I can keep in this gig forever, that would be the genius dream for me. And I remember it being really difficult when I was transitioning out of student ministry and, and significantly difficult when I was thinking about becoming what I never wanted to be, which was a lead pastor. I'm like, man, old people? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, God, I feel like, gave me this, this awesome picture that what a church is, is it's just basically a larger youth group with a more generous demographic. <laughs> and how cool would it be to youth pastor a group of people with the same perspective. That every Christian, wherever they go, are standing in one place and they have 360 degrees of direction that they could go. And to challenge those people to live all for Christ all the time. Consistent at church, at home, at work, with friends. And when we fail, and we do fail, that the grace of God would wash over us and give us the capacity to get back on track in emulating the character of Christ. Yeah, that's what you were created for. You were created to become like Christ. May we step into that this week and be the type of church that's fleshing that out more and more and more. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving us the confidence, um, even in Philippians, God, when, when you say, that we can be confident that you will finish the work that you started in us. It's easy for us to get demoralized and frustrated when we find ourselves failing all over again, when we find ourselves taking one step forward and 250 steps back. 
And yet, God, what you've called us to do is to just keep pedaling, keep pedaling, keep being faithful, keep coming back to you, having the light at the end of the tunnel of knowing that you are doing something that we can't even see right now. Lord, I pray that you empower us this week to do just that. I will give you thanks for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Love you, church. See you next week.